name is John Haskell. I'm the director of the Law Library here at the University of Idaho, and I'm a member of the Bora Foundation Committee. And on behalf of the students, faculty, and staff who are co-members of the committee, I'd like to invite you to this, the first program of this year's 2006 Bora Symposium, Resource Wars. The William Edgar Bora Outlawry of War Foundation was established in 1929 here at the University of Idaho. And its mission is to explore the causes of war and the conditions of peace. Over the course of time, the annual Bora Symposium has become the uh, premier academic function at the University of Idaho. And this uh, year's symposium proves to be uh, just as exciting as others we've had in the past. Today we're going to be uh, talking about oil and water. And introducing our speakers this evening is Associate Professor of Law Barbara Cousins, whose specialization in her teaching and research is in water law. She has had uh, experience working in alternative energy research and also has done uh, water mediation as an attorney for the state of Montana. And she will be introducing our two speakers this evening. Professor Summers? Excuse me, Cousins. I'd also like to say that the, the primary funding for the symposium comes from the foundation itself, but this year we've also received a significant amount of money from the College of Law and also from the College of Natural Resources along with individual departments within the College of Natural Resources. And you can see a list of all of the contributors on the back of your program. Okay, Professor Cousins, it's yours now. <laughs> Thank you, John. And thank you once again to the Bora Foundation and this year's committee for bringing such an outstanding group of speakers to provide such a, a timely and relevant dialogue to the University of Idaho community. Tonight, as, as John said, is the first in the next three, in three evenings of symposiums. Please join us tomorrow night for Severin Kala Suzuki's talk on an individual's responsibility, cooperation, and conflict and Wednesday night for Dr. Jared Diamond speaking on collapse, how societies choose to succeed or fail. So let's turn now to tonight's topic, oil and water, conflict over resources. Dr. Michael Clare's book, Blood and Oil, reveals a deep understanding of the history of the tie between U.S. foreign policy and oil, particularly in the Middle East one that anyone concerned with the current war in Iraq will find chilling. It's therefore disheartening to consider that water may be the oil of the future. One important distinction exists. We may find ways to wean ourselves of oil through changes in lifestyles and advances in technology. There are no alternatives to water. Dr. Aaron Wolf's work will help us explore how to avoid a future of conflict. What I'm going to do is introduce both speakers. Dr. Aaron Wolf will speak first, followed by Michael Clare, and then we'll open it up for questions and answers and discussion from the audience. I'd like to ask you now, and I'll remind you again later when you're asking questions, please come up to the microphones so everyone can hear you and so the dialogue can be recorded. Dr. Aaron Wolf is an associate professor of geography geography at Oregon State University where his research focuses on issues relating international water resources to both political conflict and cooperation. To that end, he coordinates the Transboundary Freshwater Dispute Database, which includes over 400 water-related treaties and numerous case studies, as well as assessments of indigenous and traditional methods of water conflict resolution. He's on the advisory councils of UNESCO's International Hydrologic Program and the African Development Community New Millennium World Water Tribunal. Dr. Wolf received his MS at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in water resources management with an emphasis in hydrology and his PhD also at Wisconsin in environmental policy analysis with an emphasis in dispute resolution. Most importantly, his bachelor's in geography was from San Francisco State University, where I taught before coming to Idaho. 
He's the author of numerous articles stemming from his research on transboundary conflict and cooperation. Dr. Michael Clare has been the Five Colleges Professor of Peace and World Security Studies and the director of the program of the same name since 1985. This is a joint appointment at Amherst, Hampshire, Mount Holyoke, and Smith Colleges in the University of Massachusetts, Amherst. He serves on the board of directors of the Arms Control Association and the advisory board of the Arms Division of Human Rights Watch. Dr. Clare received his bachelor's and master's degrees from Columbia University and his PhD from the Graduate School at Union Institute. He is the author of numerous publications and I highly recommend both of his books, Resource Wars and Blood and Oil. Both of them are, are for sale in the, in the back. Without further ado, then, I'd like you to join me in welcoming Dr. Aaron Wolf and Dr. Michael Clare to the Boris Symposium of 2006. Thank you. So... I drove up here with my kids, and it was an interesting experience um, from Oregon. Kind of came up the Columbia River Gorge, and um, it's a beautiful drive. But it's kind of weird the conversations we had changed suddenly as we hit the, the state line. I came into Lewiston. People kind of say, so where are you from, Oregon? What do you do, water resources? Well, the dams are staying up. <laughs> I wasn't sure what they were talking about, but... Um, Everywhere you find water, you find water conflicts. And I wanted to start uh, talking, when we talk about international waters, this is usually the place where we start. In terms of the numbers, uh, what's going on with water resources is astonishing in the magnitude of destruction. Two and a half billion people lack access to adequate sanitation. A billion people lack access to safe drinking water. 250 million illnesses and 2.2 to 5 million people die every year because of lack of access of water resources. This is a weapon of stunning magnitude. What's interesting about this, I, I talk also to a lot of security type of agencies, and I used to ask hypothetically, you know, if somebody had a, were developing a weapon that could do this, what would the response of the global community be? Well, the, the question's not hypothetical at all anymore, and what's stunning is how little we're doing. This is a, a crisis of enormous proportions. It's bigger than AIDS. It's bigger than war. It's bigger than tsunamis. It's bigger than just about any, anything else out there. And we're doing appallingly little as a consequence. What I've been asked to talk about is not this so much. That's a problem. I think the crisis itself is one that gets, is enormous. And it'll continue to get worse as we go by. People are going to continue to suffer and die. Ecosystems are going to continue to be destroyed. But yet we keep drawn, being drawn back to the question of the political ramifications of this crisis. And there I think the message is somewhat different. If we think about the things that we use water resources for, uh, we use it for a lot. We use it, this, this is one I liked. I had a grad student come up with representative pictures for water's use. This is what they came up with for transportation. Uh, we use it for everything we do in our economies, in our psychologies, in our spiritual practice. We grow our food using water. And what's interesting about this is any two uses are potentially in conflict with each other. So we have conflicts here in Idaho. We have conflicts in Oregon. We have conflicts all over the world over water. Uh, and the question is, what's the security implication? So let's look at water from a security perspective for, for a moment and see what we learn. First of all, water, unlike other resources, moves. This is terribly frustrating. Other resources have the courtesy to stay in one place, to do what they're supposed to do, and you can allocate and you can negotiate. Water doesn't do that. How much water will there be in the snake next year? We don't know. How do you allocate, how do you negotiate over a resource like that? Nature gives us a unit from the ridge to the stream that if you look from the air, we call a watershed or a catchment basin. This is nature's unit that nature gives to us where everything is connected, quality and quantity, surface water, groundwater, all connected to each other, 
And of course, politically, we absolutely ignore this. We draw our boundaries, our political boundaries, right down the middle of these watersheds, guaranteeing that we can't manage our water resources efficiently. If we look at some of the case studies that have been brought up over and over, people start to think in terms of water wars, and that's one of the, the themes of tonight. They'll talk about India and Pakistan on the Indus Basin, India and Bangladesh uh, on the Ganges Brahmaputra, the Tigris Euphrates where armies have actually been mobilized uh, over uh, water resources, the Aral Basin currently where there's immense environmental degradation and exchanges of natural gas going in one direction, water going in the other, and of course the two that are always brought up, the Nile and the Jordan Basin, where everywhere there's a border, there's stresses and constraints about, about water resources. And people have put these together. Water is a scarce resource that we use for everything we do. There's very little international law. The Court of Justice has only heard one case on uh, water resources and basically told the parties to go back and negotiate. And in the mid-90s, out came a theme where uh, people were arguing that water would be the oil of the 21st century, and Kofi Annan summed it up, fierce competition for fresh water may well become a source of conflict and wars in the future. This was when I started to get involved. I was fascinated by the idea, uh, but I was trained also as a scientist, and I wanted to dig a little bit deeper. The idea that we're running out of something and therefore we'll go to war over that something seems a little bit too simplistic, and from a scientific perspective, there was astonishing little, astonishingly little that we actually knew about water to be projecting it as the cause of all the wars of the 21st century. For one thing, we didn't even know how many international basins there were. This map came about, I needed a lead sentence in an article that I was writing, I wanted to know there are X number of international basins, I asked a grad student what X is, can you go find out? They came back three years later, their hair pulled out from their tufts, their fingernails down to the... This was a very difficult map to make which came about. Three years to make the map, it turns out X is big. There's 263 international basins, about half the land surface of the earth, about 80% of fresh water originates in shared basins, and all we'd been hearing about were these six basins over and over and over. What about the rest? What was going on? The other thing we hadn't heard about was the spectrum of possible interactions between countries. We had heard about the places where there were tensions, but there's a whole spectrum of possibilities on how states can interact. What about the countries that were cooperating? What about the countries where nothing was happening? We knew absolutely nothing about anything except for those six case studies. So out of that came the Transboundary Freshwater Dispute Database where we ended up pulling together what we tried to pull was the world's actual experience both in water conflict and in cooperation over the last 50 years and it's now the full text of 400 treaties and negotiating notes, bibliographies and so on. Students, it's all online. If you need to crib something quickly for a term paper, you can just cut and paste from here. Website's there. If you click on a basin, uh, you'll get all uh, an annotated bibliography and all the treaties associated with that uh, basin. And one of the things that we tried to do was we called, this was a, also a three-year project, where we called all of the uh, conflict databases, all of the news databases, for all of the possible interactions in the last 50 years. When states did something over water, we wanted to know about it and capture it in a database that described the intensity from very intense conflict to very intense cooperation, where it was, what the issue was, and out of that came a rather interesting story. This is our spectrum from very intense cooperation on the right, very intense conflict on the left, and you notice right off the bat, out of these 1,800 events, two-thirds are cooperative. That means that two-thirds of the time we do anything about water, it's to cooperate. And these aren't countries that like each other. These are the same ones that are being named as the, the instances of war. India and Pakistan have a treaty. The Niles negotiate in a treaty. The riparians of the Jordan have treaties. People have cooperated even when they dislike each other intently. And more to the point, if we look on the conflict side, this minus two and minus three, 
80% of conflict is, is verbal conflict. That means people are projecting wars into the future based on what's recorded in the newspaper about what a politician says. Now, I know it never happens in this country, but in other countries, sometimes politicians don't tell the truth. When somebody says we're going to go to war to protect the lifeblood of the nation, they don't mean we're going to go to war for the, to protect the lifeblood of the nation. We mean farmers, I got your back, vote for me in November. When you look at their proclamations, no troops are moved, no armies are mobilized, except for these 36 instances, minus five and minus six, armies are mobilized, troops fired 36 times, 26 of them are in the Middle East between Israelis and Arabs, the last shot fired over water in the Middle East was in 1970. That means in the worst case scenario where people are entirely out of water resources and populations are growing and the worst conflict anywhere in the universe, people are cooperating about water or not shooting at each other. That's interesting. And if we look at a minus seven at a war, not a single war in the last 50 years. Specifically a war between two countries over water resources is a scarce resource. The only w recorded war between two countries over water was 4,500 years ago between the city-states of Lagash and Uma. That's interesting. Now the story starts to get interesting. How do people cooperate over this resource? And not only do they cooperate, but the institutions that they develop survive even when they fight over other issues. So if we look at the picnic table talks between Israelis and Arabs, Survive, this is between Israel and Jordan, survive two wars between Jordan, and throughout both, they're allocating water on the Yarmouk Basin. The Mekong Committee is established in 1955, survives the Vietnam War, the bombing of Cambodia, people continue to exchange water data. The Indus Commission, established 1960, between India and Pakistan, not only does it survive two wars, but in the middle of one of the wars, India makes payments to Pakistan as part of their treaty obligations. Notice that these are the six cases that everybody's pointing to as the wars of the future. The opposite, cooperative institutions which are tremendously resilient and currently, both in the Caucasus and, and Southern Africa, you find people will talk about water when they won't talk about anything else. Which brings us to myth two, everything's okay. Everything is emphatically not okay. And this is probably the point. If everybody cooperates over water, what's the issue? Why did we invite you to Moscow? What, are you kidding? Go home, right? There's a reason I'm here. <laughs> and this is the reason. The story's more subtle. The story, I think, is more subtle and pervasive. And it's not just about countries, and it's not just about wars. For one, because countries don't go to war doesn't mean there aren't tensions. Tremendous tensions, tremendous stresses, and the time it takes to go from unilateral development to conflict resolution takes decades, literally decades. 40 years for the Jordan, 30 years to negotiate the Indus, and all the while the water's being mismanaged, so ecosystems are continuing to degrade, people are continuing to suffer, the water can't be managed the way it's meant to be managed, and water is a tremendous stress often between two countries. Two, it's not just about countries. If we drop in scale to the intranational level, we find violence going up. As you drop in scale, the likelihood of violence over water goes up. They're inversely uh, related. So that, for example, India and Pakistan have agreements. US and Canada have agreements. But within the countries, on states here in the US, uh, on the Kovri River in India, there's actually a civil war going on between two states where hundreds of people died. So as you drop in scale, there is a record of violence. And three, there's the more subtle argument, and this takes a minute, so bear with me. These are countries that are intently agriculture dependent, irrigated agriculture dependent, and their irrigation water is threatened either because of quality or quantity issues. Now, when people suddenly run out of water resources and their irrigation is dependent on those water resources, what happens? People start to migrate. Basically, you get influxes of angry, unemployed men moving to cities. 
This, if you're going to look for the security aspect, this is the security aspect, that poverty leads to suffering, which leads to political instability. And if we look at the countries that are, that are identified here, these are the ones that are absolutely at the top of the security agenda. Egypt, Iraq, Iran, India, China. Right? Basically, what this means, the security story is subtle, and it's actually about poverty alleviation. Explicitly and specifically, poverty alleviation is a security concern, and this, I would argue, is where the focus should be, and not on the possibility of countries meeting on the battlefield in warfare. The last thing I want to talk about is the future, because a lot of people say, oh, sure, nobody's done it in the last 4,500 years, but who's to say they won't in the future? One of the things we did is look historically at what the cases, the instances were that led to uh, conflict and identified what the indicators actually are of tensions. Again, we're not talking about war, but of conflict and tensions. And a lot of things people have been speculating the people who are projecting water wars in the future are assuming that scarcity leads to war, when in fact, historically, scarcity is not the driver of conflict. Scarcity, in fact, breeds institutions to deal with scarcity, and if you look at the climate that's most cooperative, it's the arid environment. This makes intuitive sense when you think about it. Well, of course, they live in a dry environment. They learn to cooperate over what they don't have. The actual indicators are uh, three. Unilateral development, somebody does something without coordinating it with the other countries. Internationalized basins, basins that break apart uh, from a, uh, either under the Soviet Union or the British Empire. All of those case studies were ones that broke apart uh, into separate countries. Or, of course, general animosity. People hate each other about other things. They'll hate each other about water. And with that, we can look into the future and speculate where the tensions could be uh, down the line. And they're not the six that people have talked about over and over. Again, all of those have been resolved to some extent or another. But the ones that we look to now, uh, a series in southern Africa, South Asia, the Salween Basin uh, is a good example, China, Thailand, uh, Burma, where all three have development plans, no two are compatible with each other, which will lend itself to tensions in the near future. Recently, we've been taking this work on identifying the actual cause of, of dispute uh, and working with the Bureau of Reclamation uh, to think about in the, uh, in the western U.S., where we're likely to see the same things. And they had done the same thing. They came up with this map a while ago, Bureau of Reclamation. What they said is where there's going to be scarcity, where demand and supply meet, that's where you're going to have conflict, ignoring human creativity, human adaptability, institutions. And so we're, help, we're going back and relooking at this map and the assumptions uh, that went into it. Kofi Annan also came around, and I'd like to leave with this quote because I think it captures uh, more of, of what's useful. There is a history of violence. It's subnational. I think looking for water wars is misplacing our energy. Two and a half million people to five million people are dying every year with or without the wars. Whether there will be resource wars or not is almost incidental. The fact is people are suffering and dying. Ecosystems are suffering and dying. As we speak, the opposite, we can use water resources to, to help promote dialogue, to help promote peace. And Kofi Annan, I think, said it best, the water problems of our world need not be only a cause of tension. They can also be a catalyst for cooperation. If we work together, a secure and sustainable water future can be ours. Thank you very much. everyone. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I was a little bit worried that um, you would interpret our presentations as uh, oil versus water for the, for the command of your attention. Uh, and I hope you won't uh, view my remarks in that light, uh, because that's not 
really what my intention is, so I want to say that ahead of time. When I wrote my book a few years ago called Resource Wars, uh, which is also the title of this conference, I, I was under the impression, uh, it was my view, that the world faces an array of potential conflicts over resources. And, and, and I do believe that there are similarities between the various kinds of resource conflicts, particularly in the 21st century when we have a rapid increase in human population, more importantly, a rapid increase in human affluence, because as people become more affluent, they consume more exponentially. And right now, we're in a world where China and India have middle classes potentially in the hundreds of millions of people, larger than the entire population of the United States. And if they all aspire to an American style way, way of life, uh, the pressure on the world's resource base will be extraordinary. Americans have something like 4.5 percent of the human uh, of the human population. Uh, we consume somewhere between 25 and 30 percent of the world's resources, and that's put a tremendous pressure on the world's supply. So, if you have India and China uh, uh, striving to duplicate our way of life, the pressures are absolutely extraordinary. So, I, and and that extends to all resources. And, and so I looked at resource wars as a, as a class of conflicts, resource wars. Um, since then, since, since resource wars was published, and I think the, the timing is important, it was May 2001, and I, I spent the summer of 2001 speaking about the topic, and then a, a, along came September 11th, just a few months later. Since 9-11 and since resource wars were published, I've come to view oil as in a class by itself, and that's what I want to talk about. I've come to view oil as especially dangerous, as uniquely dangerous for the world in general and for this country especially. So when I say that, I'm going to make the argument why I believe oil is uniquely dangerous at this moment in time. And I want to say once again, I, I don't mean to put this in a competitive sense that, you know, one re, that my resource is bigger than his resource problem. <laughs> I want you to think it that way. But I, I, my, my thinking has evolved to view oil as uniquely dangerous at this moment in time. And, and that's what I want to talk about. Now, 9-11 did have something to do with my thinking because I had been studying resource conflict before 9-11 broke out and immediately came to the view, or very rapidly came to the view, that 9-11 that was related to our oil behavior, particularly our reliance on Middle Eastern oil, and particularly as a consequence of our reliance on Middle Eastern oil, our close embrace of the Saudi Arabian royal family and, and our history of, of militarizing uh, our dependence on Middle Eastern oil, the very large presence of American forces in the region, all of this uh, as, a, so, as an irritant, as a source of friction. And the more I've studied this, the more it's clear to me uh, that you cannot separate September 11th and the rise of al-Qaeda and militant Middle Eastern terrorism without knowing the history of American oil policy in the Middle East, in, in the Persian Gulf region. I don't have time in my my, my talk tonight to, to go over that history with you, I wish I could, but if, if you do study the history, you'll, you'll, you'll find that it all goes back to the alliance forged between the U.S. and the royal family, and this was done in 1945 by President Roosevelt, so this has a very long history to it. Every American president since Roosevelt has has uh, reconstituted this alliance with the Saudi royal family, most recently when Crown Prince Abdullah was here in this country a year ago in March uh, 2005 and met with President Bush, and they embraced, and you, you, you remember the photographs of them holding hands. Uh, this, the, the, this is the natural succession 
George Bush being the successor to Roosevelt, Abdullah the son of King Abdulaziz who met with Roosevelt in 1945 when this alliance was forged. And if you look at American foreign policy since then, the Eisenhower Doctrine, the Truman Doctrine, most especially the Carter Doctrine, which says oil from the Middle East is a vital security interest of the United States. If necessary, we'll go to war to protect that. Uh, that led to the decision by the elder Bush in August, uh, August 1990 on the basis of that policy uh, to go to war to protect Saudi Arabia against the Iraqi troops then in Kuwait, which led to Operation Desert Storm, which then ended with a quarantine of Iraq, and that led in March 2003 to the invasion of Iraq. All of these events are interconnected. They all go back to uh, to, to our dependence on Middle Eastern oil, and Osama bin Laden is a product of that. His ultimate goal is to destroy the alliance between the United States and Saudi Arabia. So as I researched all of this history, um, I, came, I came to appreciate more than I had earlier just, just how central oil is to our foreign policy and our military policy, and I, I came to see uh, and to appreciate the unique uh, dangerousness of, of, this, of this relationship, and that, that led to my more recent book, Blood and Oil. So I, I, I want to make the argument now that, that at, this, at this moment, oil is uniquely dangerous and becoming more so. And I'm going to very quickly give you the four reasons why I think this is so. Now, I'm not going to mention uh, the environment. Part, partly, you know, I, I'm sure you're familiar with the environmental arguments. Oil uh, is the leading source of the carbon dioxide emissions, which are the leading cause of global warming or the accumulation of greenhouse gases and global warming. So there's, there's an environmental dimension to that. I don't think that affects oil. It does affect water because uh, it is affecting the climate and that's affecting, and, and climate is going to affect the relative availability of water in various parts of the world. Maybe Aaron could come back to that. Uh, so just put the environment aside for now. The four reasons, why, the four set of reasons why I think oil is uniquely dangerous are economic, uh, ge geopolitical, geological, and geographic. And let me describe those very briefly. First, economic. You have to bear in mind that oil is absolutely vital and essential to the American economy, especially the American economy. Others as well, but our economy in particular. Oil supplies 40% of our net energy supply. It, at this stage in time, there is no replacements in sight for that 40% of energy. We can't really increase coal with existing technology without uh, further damaging the environment. We don't have the natural gas. Nuclear power isn't, at this moment in time, a realistic solution. Uh, the the uh, renewables aren't... Um, available on the scale that we need. So oil really is crucial to our economy, to our industry. It's essential as a feedstock for all kinds of industries. It's, it's crucial for agriculture, but it's especially important for transportation. 98% of our transportation energy comes from petroleum. Virtually every car, truck, bus, train, plane, and boat uh, in, our, in this country is powered by by petroleum, and we don't really have an alternative transportation system available or in place. So our economy is highly dependent on it, and that means that when there's a disruption in the availability of petroleum, it immediately affects our economy more than anything else. Five of the six recessions since World War II were precipitated by the spike, by a spike in the price of oil or a, sh a temporary shortage. We saw the summer with Katrina when there was just a week's uh, shortage, a disruption in the supply of petroleum. The prices went up very rapidly, and that rippled through the economy. It had enough, several airlines then went bankrupt or had to close down because they couldn't any longer afford the higher price of 
of jet fuel, so on. Uh, so if there's any major disruption in the future availability of petroleum, it will have an immediate effect. Right now, and, and why I say the situation now is so particularly dangerous, is we have used up, we are now using every last barrel of productive capacity in the world today. There is no surplus capacity anywhere on the planet. That is to say, in, in the past, uh, Saudi Arabia could crank up if there were a war or a catastrophe to make up for the shortage. There is no spare capacity anywhere on the planet. So any major overseas crisis or climate crisis that severely affects the availability of petroleum will have an immediate economic effect. And I could think of half a dozen such that could occur within the next year. Uh, Nigeria could descend into further violence. We could have a shootout with Iran. I think the possibility of that is better than 50-50 right now. That could lead to an immediate blow up in the Middle East. There could be sabotage of Saudi Arabian oil facilities, which was attempted last month. We're coming into hurricane season again, which could very well be because of global warming, more destructive than last year's, and that would affect any of these will instantly affect the economy uh, very negatively. So that's the economic dimension. Uh, second, the geological aspect of this. Uh, very briefly, I don't have time to do justice to this question, but um, whereas water is renewable each, let's see, I don't want to make comparisons. <laughs> Let me just, oil is finite. There's only so much of it. Uh, it took hundreds of millions of years to produce the oil that we have. Uh, that's estimated when oil production began in 1859 to have been about two trillion barrels of oil. We've used up about half of that, which might be cause for some optimism because you could say half of it is left. Uh, but we've used up most of that first half just in the past 30 or 40 years. Uh, and at the rate that we're consuming uh, the remainder uh, will run out of it in another 30 or 40 years. Now, it won't happen exactly that way because we won't go on pumping it as extensively as we are today to the last drop of oil. Long before that time, and the question is exactly when that long before that time will come, and, and that is a, a matter of intense concern and debate for everyone, should be for everyone on the planet, long before we reach the last barrel of oil, it'll start becoming very hard to get. The last barrels of oil are going to be very deep underground, far offshore. They're going to be in the Arctic. They're going to be in hurricane areas. They're going to be in very dangerous countries where there are a lot of terrorists. The last barrels of oil will be very hard to get and very costly and very dangerous. And, 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 and that will become increasingly so from now on. So some people say that the moment when the actual uh, supply will begin to diminish and start going down, that's called the moment of peak oil, is upon us this year, next year, it may be five years or 10 years, but somewhere not too distant from now, the global supply of oil will begin to decline and in become increasingly hard to get at. So that's the geological dimension that we have to uh, address. Uh, the third factor very quickly is geographical aspect. Oil uh, is not only finite, and, and, and will be eventually uh, extracted, but it's also highly concentrated. It's not located where we would like it next to our service stations in this country. That would be very convenient. And then you wouldn't meet, need me speaking here. Um, but it's not. It's inconveniently, from our perspective, distributed. Um, it, and uh, there was a time in which the balance uh, between the global north, the older industrialized countries, and the global south was pretty equal. Up until uh, 1950, two-thirds of the world's oil production was in the global north, the United States, Canada, Europe, and the European part of the former Soviet Union. 
But we've used up most of that oil in the global north. Almost all that's left is in the global south, what we used to call the third world or the developing world. Most of it in the Middle East, some in Africa, some in the Andean region of Latin America, and some in Central Asia. And from now on, increasingly into the future, that's where we're going to have to, all of us, we who consume it, we consumers, the U.S. and other countries, will have to go to those countries. And these countries in the developing world that still have some oil are all inherently unstable. I, t I don't have time to lay out this argument in detail. Um, it, it has to do to some degree with the fact that, that oil uh, attracts uh, autocratic rulers and dictators and military hunters because it's very valuable. So in a poor country, you want to control a source of wealth. So you stage a military coup or uh, rigged elections, and you get control of that oil and the wealth, and you want to keep it. So you're going to do everything in your power to prevent other people from taking over the government, including all kinds of violence. And so the any, only way to change governments in oil-producing countries usually is through violence, through conflict. And so most of the remaining oil producers are riven by ethnic and religious and political conflicts. I mentioned Nigeria, where there's a low-level insurgency, not so low-level anymore, uh, between the people in the south who have been excluded from any of the oil wealth and the people who control the country in the center of the country. In Iraq, where our troops are at risk daily, a lot of that, what's driving that is the competitive struggle between the Kurds, the Sunnis, and the Shiites for control over the future oil revenues of Iraq. All this talk you hear about a constitution this and democracy that, all of it is about who's going to get the majority of whatever oil revenues will be coming in the future. Uh, the Shiites and the Kurds each trying to monopolize they have oil in their regions. The Sunnis do not. They want to divide, they want to have control over their own oil. The Sunnis will be left with nothing uh, where they used to have control. They are going to fight to prevent that from happening. And, that, and, and, and that's the source, the main source of violence in Iraq. So the, the, the distribution of this it, it, and combined with these, the, this political reality makes oil inherently unstable. And the fourth, uh, final point here, I want to bring this all together, is the geopolitical aspect of this. Because oil is essential to our economy, uh, because it is a finite resource that's increasingly scarce, because it's found mainly in dangerous areas, the United States has made the pursuit of foreign oil a military matter, a matter of national security. That's official U.S. government policy. The Carter Doctrine says that we'll go to war for oil. And there are a whole lot of other declarations that make this clear. And the United States has securitized its reliance on oil from dangerous areas by sending troops, by building bases, by forming military alliance with local governments, with intervening in the politics of these countries and staging coup d'etats, covert operations. All of this uh, has been ongoing and is accelerating and it's spreading from the Middle East to Central Asia, to Africa, and now to Latin America. So there's an accelerating tempo of the militarization of our dependence on this scarce oil from dangerous areas. That's that's cause for concern enough. Uh, that what makes this a, a, a matter of unique concern in my mind is that other countries are finding themselves in the same predicament, and particularly China, which like us uh, is becoming increasingly dependent on oil from the same areas, needs more and more oil each year to support its economic growth at a time when there's considerable question about the future availability of oil. So it's trying to build up its stake in the Middle East and Central Asia and Africa and Latin America, competing with us for influence in these areas, like us sending troops, advisors, weapons, militarizing its foreign oil policy at the same time we are in the same dangerous places. 
And this, this is why I'm, I, I see oil as unique, that great powers are prepared to go to war over it and increasingly are basing their military policy up, uh, increasingly on both sides, um, or many sides, really. Japan is also engaged in a territorial dispute with China over, in this case, natural gas as well as oil in the East China Sea that could quickly bring the United States involved if that's not resolved. So um, to, to finish, uh, oil, I think, is the center of our dilemma, certainly for environmental reasons but for these other reasons as well. And I personally believe that addressing this danger that this represents is the single most important task facing the United States in the 21st century. It's the source, it is critical to the issue of terrorism, it's critical to the issue of our relations with the Middle East, it's critical to our relations with Russia and China. I can talk about how it fits in in our Russia policy, but certainly crucial to our relations with China. It's the greatest source of potential conflict, I believe, uh, and the economy is at risk. So for all of these reasons, Oil has to be the central economic, political, military, and environmental concern of our country. And I, I think it requires a, 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 a massive effort on our part in this country to break what the president calls our addiction to oil, to demilitarize our oil policy by engaging in very rapid and and major effort to cut back on our consumption through conservation, through higher fuel efficiency, through greater reliance on public transit, and to develop a crash program to develop petroleum alternatives that don't harm the environment. And to do that, we're going to need hundreds of billions of dollars a year, make no mistake about it. And that's going to require, I believe, a higher taxation on gasoline use to provide the income we need to develop the alternatives. This is essential if we're going to survive the century uh, intact as a civilization, as a society. And so I do believe it's the most important task facing all of us, but especially those people in the room who are, who are younger who are going to have to live through this century. Uh, I think that they, we all have to work together to make the transition from a petroleum-based economy to a post-petroleum economy, our central task of the century. Thank you. Well, thank you. Excellent talks. We have some time now for questions from the audience. What I would like to ask you to do is line up at the uh, microphones that are on either side, and I will call on you to ask questions while you're getting up and getting ready to ask those questions, and, and our speakers will remain seated. I think those microphones should be turned on now. Yeah. Um, while, while people are getting ready to ask questions, I'm going to get it started with just one. We've, we've heard a lot about some of the differences in terms of conflict between oil and water. Um, water, if you uh, ignore this extremely environmentally unfriendly phenomena, um, we tend to use where it is, and maybe that plays a role in reducing the conflict, whereas the conflict with oil is upon us. But I was struck by something that, that each of you referred to. Aaron, you said that um, there's probably a greater likelihood of conflict due to displacement of people from whatever the reason is, disruption in water supply, either because of climate change or some other disruption related to war, and that poverty leads to conflict. Um, and I was struck by the same thing from you, Michael, that we're not yet fighting over the last drop of oil. We're probably close to peaking, but what we're, we seem to be fighting over is the unequal distribution of wealth in the countries that we are trying to extract oil from. Um, 
and I think in the spirit of the, the Boris Symposium in examining reasons for conflict and ways to promote lasting peace, I'd be interested in, in both of your views on that, on the underlying causes. Are they similar? Um, and, and if so, what can we learn f from them? So thank you. Um, I, I can't speak to comparison because bottom line, I'm a water guy and I, I don't know oil. Uh, I'm, I know Michael's work and have for years and have huge respect for it uh, and, and um, intuitively agree with everything he said tonight. I think on the water side, the frustration I have is, again, I think people are looking in the, in the wrong place. It's, it's hugely frustrating to be in a room of security people trying to get across that even though I don't think war's about to break out, that it's not hugely important. There's kind of a, when, when security people find out that something's only humanitarian, their, their eyes kind of glaze over as if that somehow makes it less important. And that's, that's tremendously frustrating. I think humanitarian issues uh, are the issues of the day. And, but if you need a security spin in order to put the resources into it, which a lot of security people seem to, uh, I think this argument has a, a very clear and explicit uh, security issue. I think it's true. Poverty, uh, lack of access to resources, uh, displaced population, human suffering, all lead to security concerns. Uh, flat out. The, well, I'll leave it at that. I'm not entirely sure how best to answer because I'm a political scientist and I always have one, two, and three. Sometimes it's four, sometimes it's five, uh, and, it, and it, it's hard to pin, pin down. I, and I, um, I do think that there's an issue of equity. Equity is, 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 the, is what I would put as being central rather than poverty is equity. If the supply is small, but it's shared equitably between whoever the whoever is, um, the, the, the risk of conflict is low. Uh, if it's large, if the supply is large, but it's shared equally, the, the, the likelihood of conflict is low. But whether it's small or large, if it's shared inequitably, and there's, there, there's a clear awareness of that inequity, that's going to be a source of conflict. Okay, thank you. Let's start over here. Yes, um, my question basically is one related to um, how these commodities are valued in the economic marketplace. And perhaps, I guess I've always been somewhat confused, so I'm kind of curious about your reflections on on how the dollar amount that we put on, say, water. Living in Moscow, I know that I pay a water bill, but that water, that cost is really related to its extraction and transportation to my house. Nothing relative to that drop of water. Now, oil, it's a little more complicated. There's the resource and development costs and its transportation costs. We know what a barrel of oil costs, but in essence, it seems like we've grossly underestimated and undervalued these resources in the economic marketplace. And is that not potentially a means for escalating conflicts? We're just not paying what it's truly worth. Hmm. Hmm. So again, I'll, I'll speak on the water side. I, I think you're right. I think the, the commodification of water, uh, if we're going to look into the future, I think that's going to be the cause of tension. And not, not quite in the way I think you described it. I think um, there are people, efficiency people, economists in the World Bank and the IMF who argue that if people did pay an appropriate amount of water, then it would go to uh, its most appropriate use. And there is a certain amount of truth to that. Certainly, as you pointed out, in the Western U.S., we don't pay anything for water, and we will. We, we are willing to. You open your tap, you pay .004 cents a cubic meter, to, uh, for your water. If you buy it in a bottle, you pay $10,000 a cubic meter in a bottle. Uh, we are willing to pay a certain amount for the water, and there are, I think, arguments to be made about the, the economics of distribution. Where the, the arguments come is how much can you com 
commodify water. And I think uh, this gets tied into the whole discussion of globalization, uh, of uh, privatization. There is a concern among a number of people, not least of whom are our Canadian neighbors, that if we say water is a commodity that has to be treated as an economic good, and if to, in order to belong to the WTO you have to lower all of your barriers to the exchange of commodities, could a country be forced to sell its water resources? And that's not, a, uh, that's not hypothetical. There is a, a company in, in uh, Southern California that's now suing under NAFTA to be able to move water from, uh, from British Columbia. So I think there are two sides of it. I think you're right that we do need more of a market mechanism, and as water becomes relatively more scarce, that does happen. In the rest of the world, people generally pay for water, and, and when it gets scarce enough, we'll do the same thing too. Uh, but I do think we need to watch how much of it we just need to appreciate is intrinsic for its own sake, for the aesthetic, for the, for the ecosystem, for the, for the intrinsic value that it has as well. Uh, my, my response uh, would be, I don't know, a little bit different. Um, and, and that is that, and that's the essence of my argument, oil is different from all other commodities in this country. It is different because it's a matter of national security. I mean, that is official U.S. policy. The uh, protection of our access to the oil of the Middle East is a matter of national security, and we will use any means necessary to get that, including military force. That's the stated policy of the United States. And, and that puts it in a very different light, because that means you're willing to shed blood. And how do you put a price on blood? And, and even if you just put, add the price of military operations, to, what, to what, what percentage of the cost of the war in Iraq should be attributed to our addiction to oil? Some people might say zero. Some people might say 100 percent. I think it's, more, you know, for the purpose of discussion, I'll say it's 75 percent. Anybody wants to challenge me can. We're going we're, we're, we're to wind up spending half a trillion dollars on the war in Iraq before we're done, and we've already sacrificed the life of thousands of Americans. That is not, it's pr priceless. So, and, and if we continue uh, on this path of securitizing our oil, we're going to shed a lot more human blood for our, uh, to supply our addiction to it. So this is not, I wish it were an economic matter. Then we wouldn't be risking uh, lives over it. But, but it's treated differently. And I, I think we have to, we, uh, I personally think we have to, we have to break that connection between oil and, and our national security. But that, that's going to take a change in, in national attitude. My question is that it is um, uh, directed more towards uh, um, Michael. Um, I, uh, I'm not an economist, so I may be totally off base, but it seems to me like uh, oil is such a centralized resource that has so few like places where you can get it from that if oil goes away, uh, despite uh, it, we, whether or not we get uh, alternative forms of energy, it seems like the value of the dollar might fragment because it is the single most thing that people spend, you know, well, it, it's the most distributed from the least number of places worldwide. So if oil goes away, we'd be getting resources from all over the place, but if oil's still around, we're still only getting oil from you know, one or two places, and I'm wondering if, you know, if uh, that's actually the case, or what would happen to the economy, just forgetting all the rest of the social issues oh, very, if oil very, goes very, away. Very, very interesting question. Probably can't do justice to it. It's, of course, it's not just oil itself, but how we choose to use it. Uh, and in this country, we choose to use it in grossly fuel inefficient monster vehicles to satisfy <laughs> our ego or whatever else. Um, and, and, uh, and, and, that re and, and to fill up those monster vehicles, we must import more and more oil. And that's costing us now a billion dollars a day or close to a billion dollars a day. 
uh, now estimated in, in, at $320 billion a year in 2006 is going to be our bill for imported oil. Uh, and that will, that will, that constitutes a half or nearly half of our balance of payments deficit, which is, which is greatly contributing to the weakness of the dollar and the fragility of the American economy in general is our, is our, all the money we're spending overseas to pay for this stuff. So, um, if, depending on what the alternatives we choose, if we choose to emphasize biomass that's grown in our own country, we'll, we would be spending that money here instead of sending it abroad, and I think that would be greatly to our benefit. Uh, if we invested in, in fuel-efficient vehicles and, and high-speed rail and, and in uh, wind turbines and solar technology in this country instead of in, in old-style coal plants, that would be a boon to our economy and employment. But instead, it's Japan that's developing the fuel-efficient cars, and the French were developing high-speed trains, and the Danes were developing the wind turbines. So each year we go into the future, we're undermining our economy through our addiction to this obsolete technology. Go ahead. Uh, this is, uh, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, <laughs> a little bit tall. Um, this question is actually directed towards Aaron Wolf, uh, and I'll preempt it with just a little bit of history. Uh, I'm actually a, was a Peace Corps volunteer in West Africa and see, have seen my fair share of uh, localized water conflict. And my question is, um, namely, uh, how do you suggest addressing potable water uh, issues and problems in developing nations, especially in corrupt nations such as Nigeria mm. or Kenya or someplace mm. like that? And uh, especially where resources are minuscule. And, uh, I, and to your knowledge, uh, what kind of other international um, interventions have, have taken place? I'm sorry, international interventions about what? Uh, just uh, say, for instance, like the FAO or the UN uh, and their involvement in trying to address problems of potable, potable water. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I think I'd come back to, to something uh, Michael said on the, on the economics. Uh, I'd have to go back and look at the, at the figures, but it turns out to be hugely cheaper to actually get water to people than the cost to the economy of their uh, being sick and, and dying. Uh, I think it's always a question of political will. And, and again and again, it just astonishes me. You know, we sit here. Um, uh, the disproportionate amount we in the U.S. put to our military versus what we put to USAID, especially once we understand what the root causes of, of conflict are. Um, I think there's, just last week in Mexico City was the World Water Forum. This happens every three years, and the water ministers from all over the world get together and come up with some profound proclamation about how water is life, and we really should be doing more, and then they all go home, and very little else gets done. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know the answer to how you get the North to care about the South. It's stunning to me that we don't. It's stunning to me on a rational level, on an economic level, and certainly on a humanitarian level. Uh, your point about corruption also is really well taken. I think the same thing, the one place water and oil have something in common is that despots like the big projects and despots like big dams because somebody makes a chunk of money on them and despots like big uh, pipelines and, and, and mega projects and it happens in this country too. It's much sexier for a politician to, uh, uh, to open a new dam than to greet a, a train of, of low flush toilets, right? I mean, that's the, the, nature, of the, the nature of the beast. Um, the, uh, I don't know the answer to it, and I'm, I'm glad. I think one of the answers is the kind of experience you've had. I think getting people out into the South and seeing what's going on is part of bringing that heart back and trying to affect change when you get back here. Thank you. Um, both speakers have addressed it a little bit, but I wanted to put it in maybe a little bit different frame. Um, I'm trying to imagine a president that could run for president on higher gas taxes. <laughs> 
Um, I'm trying to imagine an administration built around, you know, equitable water resources. And uh, my curiosity is, do we, for both speakers, is what do you see as being the most effective mechanisms for addressing these kinds of conflicts? We've talked about economic, we've talked about macro-political, we've talked about local level. For both your respective resources, what do you feel are the most effective mechanisms for addressing these things? Do, do, do you mean practically speaking or the most effective mechanisms to getting politicians to wake up? I mean, practically speaking, because it, that's, that's a different question, actually, I think. Well, I'm, I, I, actually, I think they are related. Uh, the politicians will do what's nece necessary when they feel that their constituents demand that they do so. Now, I, I think we're going through a sea change in this society on these issues. Uh, if, if a year ago I would have been a little bit timid about saying that we need to put a dollar's tax on gasoline tomorrow, now I feel much safer in saying it because polling data has shown that the American public have become much more concerned about our reliance on Middle Eastern energy, um, and therefore they're more prepared to take steps that they wouldn't have contemplated a year ago. Now, I don't think that's because they've become more enlightened, but because they're more aware of the dangers we face. I think Hurricane Katrina was was example of showed people how vulnerable we are to powerful forces that that was a hurricane but it also interrupted our oil supply and made people aware of that um, so I think there's a political change taking place and interestingly enough it's not only Democrats but in the Republican Party that you're seeing signs of this there is now a backlash against the Bush-Cheney administration among Republicans on this issue. Uh, uh, Senator uh, Lugar gave a speech last week which was very striking. Uh, uh, James Schlesinger gave a speech a few weeks ago, the former Reagan Secretary of Defense. And, and what, what they're saying is much more investment in ethanol, but not produced in the conventional way of cooking it, which is very inefficient, but by uh, through as enzymes and other ways of being able to use agricultural waste products or grasses that are that are that that grow rel red readily um, in developing hybrids that can be plugged in at night to the electrical grid when they're not in high use. Uh, a, uh, incentives for people to drive more fuel-efficient vehicles through taxation or through rewards. Uh, certainly, the, the, the single thing that we could most do is to double the minimum fuel efficiency of average American vehicles, which is no technical problem. It's just a matter of political will, as Aaron was saying. So I, I don't think there's great mystery about the things that are necessary. I mean, I could go on and on. Uh, we, we certainly need more high-speed rail connecting cities and more public transit, and we're going to have to move in that direction to avoid the catastrophic effects of climate change. So the only question is how rapidly we move, and that's a matter of political will, and that means energizing at the grassroots to put pressure on, on members of Congress, and, and I, I, I see this as something, um, I, I see this as something that has a generational element to that. I'll say this, the Bush-Cheney energy plan is generational warfare against young people in this audience, because what they're essentially saying is we'll, we'll, we'll perpetuate our fuel inefficient, environmentally catastrophic energy behavior for another 20 years and then you poor bastards are going to have to deal with the what's left of our economy if anything is left and, and tough tough on you if you we're not going to we're not going to leave you with with the foundation for a new uh, an environment this is this is generational warfare and and i hope that the young people in the room uh, realize that they're under assault by this and start taking measures to replace people who aren't meeting their fundamental future needs. Thank you. Thank you. Well said. 
Um, I think I think water is is absolutely suited for a kind of bottom up grassroots uh, uh, change, and and we've seen it in lots of different settings. I think uh, certainly in the Western U.S., people at the watershed level, watershed councils are, are clearly affecting politics as you move up. Uh, in Oregon, there's a uh, the Umatilla Basin, which a group of stakeholders got together, including tribes and cities, and and environmentalists and basically are now forcing the state to change the way water's regulated. Uh, and we see it around the world. I think we, we saw, I don't know, the students don't remember, but those of us with a little more gray remember the contract with America and Newt Gingrich and how they were, I don't know if you remember, they were taking out full page ads and kind of checking off the legislation. The legislation. And when they got to the Clean Water Act, it came to a screeching halt because I think uh, the people who were designing that, that uh, agenda didn't get that both sides of the aisle totally get water and uh, doesn't matter if you're a tree hugger from Oregon or a good old boy from, uh, from Oregon, <laughs> that, that you still, a lot of people like to hunt and fish and get out and realize when their water holes go into hell and are going to are gonna make people uh, stop and clean it up. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Let's move over to this side of the room. Right. Um, for either presenter, what do you guys think is the most economically, environmentally viable source of alternative energy to petroleum products? Hmm. Driving less yeah. and more fuel-efficient vehicles. Uh -huh. that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the short answer. Um, remember, I, I, I emphasize driving because I emphasize oil, and, 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 and our problem in our society is a transportation problem more than anything else. I mean, wind power and solar power, I think, have great promise for generating electricity, and some of the other alternatives have that potential. But it's our addiction to oil for personal transportation that's the cause of all the other things that I was talking about. So we really have to solve, we have to get a grip on the transportation problem. And, 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 and that means if, you, if people ha should drive much more fuel efficient vehicles uh, or ones that don't require any petroleum, that has to, that's the bottom line. That's fine. Now what, Fuel they use, you know, that requires some more testing. Um, I'm, I'm very intrigued by the promise of cellulosic ethanol uh, because it could be grown here. It could use materials that are that are wasted, uh, but it's but that technology is not yet developed, and that's something that that the next that people in this room could really make a contribution to. No. You want to? No. Sorry. Go ahead. My question is for Professor Clare. Um, Professor Clare, I recently uh, read something uh, that stated that, I believe it was Saudi Arabia specifically that was mentioned that uh, that country was um, very secretive about its oil reserves, even exaggerating the amount of oil reserves they actually had. I was just looking for your comment on the accuracy of that statement as well as why Saudi Arabia would do that. Well, uh, thank you. Now, I, my answer is very much dependent on the work of a man named Matthew Simmons, Matt Simmons, who I understand spoke in Spokane uh, in the past year. So some of you may have had an opportunity to hear him. He's the CEO of, of uh, Simmons & Company International, the leading investment banker in the oil business. He has a new book out, which you can get in the bookstores, called Twilight in the Desert. And what I'm going to tell to you is the synopsis of that. You know, basically, the Saudi Arabia, remember I spoke earlier about uh, how oil leads to the concentration and the power of clans. So we talk about Saudi Arabia, uh, but bear in mind that the oil of Saudi Arabia is the property of the royal family, 7,000 princes and princesses. It's not the property of the Saudi people. It's the property of the private estate uh, of, remember, it's Saudi Arabia. That's the Arabia of the Saud family. Uh, we're talking about a medieval institution which controls this oil and their wealth and their power and the degree to which our presidents bow down in supplication to them <laughs> and protect them 
depends on our belief that we depend on, that that they're going to supply our needs forever. That is that's what keeps them in power. So they have a very powerful vested interest in us being ignorant about how much oil they have and 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 to lead us to believe as they claim that they will supply all the oil we need for another 75 to 100 years. Now that you know, if that's the case, we're going to be protecting the next two or three generations of princes. Um, that, that is American policy, to protect the princes, the heirs to Abdel Aziz. They want us to maintain that dynasty in power as long as they possibly can. Uh, so they have a very strong interest in concealing from us the extent of their oil supply. Uh, so that's the political reason. What the actual truth of the matter is, is a little bit difficult to know because they won't allow anybody outside the royal family to really see the information. Now this Matthew Simmons, who I spoke about, got a hold of some, uh, some very technical studies produced by their oil engineers, which suggest that they're using a lot of water, pumping a lot of water into their wells to keep up the pressure. And that typically is an indication that the oil fields are in decline because if they're not coming out of the ground naturally, that, that's when they're rich and powerful and vibrant. If you're pouring a lot of water in, it means the oil wells are in decline. I'll say one more thing about I'm very concerned about this because I think if we knew the truth of this matter, it would alter our foreign policy and our military policy, and maybe fewer people would die as a result. So I think it matters. Um, but just one little tidbit of information. Uh, the Department of Energy in 2004 said that Saudi oil production was going to double between 20, uh, 2005 and 2025 from 10 to 12 to 22 and a half million barrels a day. Uh, and then Matthew Simmons' book came out saying that there's no way on earth that this is going to happen. Uh, the Department of Energy last year cut their estimate of future Saudi production in half without any explanation. Um, and beforehand, before that, they were saying, we don't have to worry about oil. You don't have to worry about oil because the Saudis will provide. Now they're saying, well, maybe there's some reasons to they're not saying that. Their figures reveal that they have some doubts about that. And if they have doubts about Saudi Arabia's ability to provide, then you could be sure that there's no future for oil because nobody else could replace them. So this is an important question you raised, and I'm sorry I took so long to answer. Thank you. Good evening. I teach in the School of Journalism and Mass Media. What advice would each of you give to my students who are interested in learning more about these issues to better explain them to audiences that uh, aren't interested and don't care and, and don't really want to understand the complexities of oil and, and water? And, and beyond that, uh, what uh, particular publications or websites mm -hmm. Uh, would you suggest that all of us be reading regularly to stay abreast of these issues? Mm -hmm. you start. Okay, so uh, in, no, stay because I have a question for you too. There's something about there's something about. Um, well, let me answer your question first. The, the, the state of the state of the world is great. Uh, the World Watch publications are great. Um, it's worth keeping an eye also on the World Bank stuff and and the IMF stuff. Um, Maud Barlow in, in Canada has her angry finger on the pulse of privatization and it's really worth uh, uh, keeping up with her. Um, my question is this. I get interviewed all the time about water wars and every time I go through the same thing and every time I, I, I'm stunned in my optimism by the fact that there's this elixir that's brought people who hate each other to ne negotiation table. And to me, that's an amazing story, the history of water cooperation and the possible future for water cooperation. And they always nod politely. And the headline the next day is always water wars on the horizon. My question is, what is it about journalism that has to make it into a conflict setting? Well, if I can boil it down into <laughs> a, an overgeneralization, it's that uh, conflict makes news and consensus doesn't. Uh, the planes that don't crash 
uh, aren't written up, the planes that do crash do. So what can we teach your students then <laughs> <laughs> to be able to look at the question more subtly, to realize that get, people getting along, particularly people like Indians and Pakistanis, Israelis and Arabs, people in the, in the throes of, of, of horrific conflict have cooperated. What is it that we can teach that that then becomes an interesting story? I think repeating the story over and over again at places like this until it, it becomes the conventional wisdom and replaces the war, war headlines and the, the near war headlines. Thank you. Sorry about that, but you stood up. <laughs> glad, I, uh, glad to engage. <laughs> Professor Clare? Uh, I'll just be very brief. Uh, in the interest of time, um, I mean, I, I think oil issues now are going to penetrate popular culture, so it's not going to be very hard to get to be to write about this, to talk about it. Syriana was a sort of semi-fictionalized account of our ties with the Saudi royal family, so that's entered popular culture. There are going to be a lot more movies down the pike about this. I know of them. Uh, I just just on the on the on the source of information. Uh, the, the, the answer to that is to go to where the people in power go for information. And in the, this case, uh, they go to the Wall Street Journal. If you want to find out what's going on in the world, you do not read the popular mass media because that's not for the purpose of educating people whose decisions matter for the most part. Uh, those people read the Wall Street Journal. And so the reportage in the Wall Street Journal on these issues is by far the best. Because the decision, if you're going to invest a billion dollars in these various uh, oil companies, you want to know the truth about what the vulnerabilities are. Mm -hmm. So in every field, there are trade publications. That's where the good information is. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, due to time, we'll just take one more question from each side, and then we'll adjourn to more informal discussion. My apologies to those of you standing up. Go ahead. Two questions for Dr. Clare. Just one. Just oh, some time. come on. <laughs> well, could you uh, speak in more detail about the obvious paradox between your points on economics and your points on uh, geopolitics? Hmm. Uh, obviously, our economy is funding um, the tyrants that are rising and uh, who are, uh, have substantial national treasuries built on oil that, are, that come from our exchange. Um, this is a clear paradox. We're funding the rise, and since oil is sort of a fungible thing, it, it doesn't matter really where we're buying it from. Nonetheless, the, the price of oil goes up. That, we spend that money. That money funds these tyrants. Um, it builds their treasury. It builds their ability to uh, do mischief. And I'd like to um, hear in, in a little more detail your views on that. But I would like to beg also just one more, much more brief question, if I may. If you could also address the issue of materials. Oil, oil produces also not only transportation and manufacturing uh, energy, but vital materials that we use every day, synthetic materials. How much oil do we import? Do you have any idea how much oil we import um, in the form of synthetic materials that you know also is sucked out of the ground? If you yeah. could, if you could maybe that, address that. that that's too. easy. I did not understand the nature of your first question. Okay. I'm sorry. Maybe I just didn't follow your line of thought, but I um, did, didn't grasp the nature of it. All right. From your uh, two, two of the points that you spoke about: economics and geopolitics. Right. There clearly, there's clearly a paradox there in that the economics of our country and our economic dependence on oil, okay, our spending um, on oil, that is funding these geo, the geopolitical condition that you described. Okay? So a lot of the money that we spend goes into the treasuries of these tyrants, of these dictators that you talked about, okay? That gives them the leverage then to make mischief, to become a bigger tyrant, to, to um, carry on with a variety of enterprises, like Saddam Hussein did, and many others, many others that are, um, for example, funding terrorism. Does, does that terrorism. explain the question? Do you want to go ahead? 
I don't, I, I'm sorry, I, I don't, I There's don't a clear think. paradox between the spending of our money right. and where that's going and the rise of, to, to put I a point on it, I international guess, terrorism yeah. or the ability to fund those activities. I see what you're saying, yes, I, I mean, perhaps. That's, that, 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 that is true, the, 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 you, what you need to add to that, if I'm understanding you correctly, is so long as those people remain useful to us. Because when they no longer re remain useful to us, they have to be gotten rid of. So, uh, so we will tolerate, we will tolerate a certain amount of of misbehavior on the part of these tyrants who are, are who are, uh, who are, and as you say, making more trouble for us in the end. As as long as we see a net return, um, you know, the, um, a, a more benefit than harm. As soon as they turn, uh, they have to be replaced. I mean, Saddam Hussein was an American ally for as long as he was an American enemy because he was considered to be a bastion against Iran, which was in the 1970s and 1980s was considered a greater threat than Iraq was, but when he invaded Kuwait, he had to be replaced. Uh, and and I, I think that is the general practice. And uh, so as long as these potentates satisfy our basic needs, we're willing to turn the other way to their misbehavior. But uh, when it becomes, when, when they no longer serve our purposes, uh, then, then, then regime change becomes the the call of the day. So I don't know if that's answering your question, but that was my best attempt at it. We could talk later if you want. On the other point, um, our energy goes uh, seventy percent for transportation, fifteen percent for our petroleum use, seventy percent for transportation, fifteen percent for home heating, especially in the Northeast and 15% for industry, that includes agriculture uh, and manufacturing of petrochemicals, plastics, pharmaceuticals, and the like. So about 15% of the total amount is for the purposes that you're describing, which probably are more important than the others. I mean, I, I think you could collapse the 70% in half which is why I emphasize the transportation. Mm -hmm. uh, but cutting the home heating in half would be a real problem and cutting back on pharmaceuticals and lubricants and agricultural needs would be pain more painful. But that's of the petroleum that we import. I was referring to synthetic materials that are already converted that we also import. Oh, that's a small percent. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's go over here. This question is for Dr. Wolf. Uh, what would you say is the, the main, one of the main causes for the scarcity of water uh, throughout the world now and into the future? Is it more ecosystem degradation, climate change, or is it more population movements into areas that are arid or have no water source? Well, I, I assume when you say scarcity, you're, you're talking per capita scarcity, because the reason for scarcity is it rains in some places and doesn't in others, right? Right, but it would also be because uh, because of ecosystem degradation, you know, we had water resources in the Sure. Now, because either population movement or the degradation of uh, the environment that causes the, that we can't use the water anymore. Right, right. So why can't we use the water? I, I think there's, I think you hit your, put your finger on all three of them. There's three things that we're doing. We're using too much of it, we're polluting what we have, and we're adjusting the time in a, in a way that's not sustainable. Those, and if we need to get a handle on it, I think we need to get a handle on, on all three. I think particularly the quality aspect of it. Uh, quantity is something that, again, come back to the first gentleman asked about market mechanisms. And I think eventually market mechanisms do kick in a bit for the scarcity aspect. But once you, once you degrade an ecosystem or a body of water, an aquifer, uh, that, that sticks around for a good while, particularly in, in groundwater. And uh, once the ecosystems are gone, they, they rarely come back. Thank you. Thank you. 
I'd like to say thank you to Dr. Wolf and Dr. Claire. This has been an excellent dialogue, and thank you to all of you for participating. I'd like to ask you to walk to tomorrow night's symposium and drink tap water, buy a filter. Please join me in thanking our speakers.